Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies. This is Cardiac Heart Failure. In this episode here, we're going to talk a little bit about heart failure and the nursing care of. So let's start out with just giving a little bit of background on what heart failure is. Heart failure is the progressive decompensation of cardiac function, and it's caused by one of these problems, most commonly by myocardial infarction, but also can be a cardiomyopathy, chronic tachycardia, or valvular dysfunction. So any of those situations can cause this progressive decompensation in cardiac function. What happens is we have an imbalance between oxygen supply and oxygen demand of the myocardium, which leads to this progressive decompensation. So on presentation, we're going to see a progressive decrease in cardiac output. Typically, this is going to happen over a period of years. However, it could happen very rapidly if our patient has a myocardial infarction. So they have a big MI. Now they have a big area of the myocardium that's no longer functioning well, and the patient can easily go into developing heart failure. In most cases, it is a progressive decompensation in cardiac function that's caused by one of those other problems. Maybe the patient has had a decrease in the perfusion to the myocardium over a long period of time, and that is decreasing cardiac output, so not necessarily the myocardial infarction, or cardiomyopathies, chronic tachycardia, etc. So on presentation, we expect to see tachycardia and hypotension. Tachycardia is one of the results of the compensatory mechanisms that we'll take a look at here in just a moment. Hypotension with a narrowed pulse pressure, jugular venous distension, diaphoresis, pallor, and a backup of fluid. Now, depending on which side of the heart is involved will be the indicator as to where we're going to see the fluid. So, for example, if the right side is involved, then we're going to get peripheral edema, jugular venous distension, and tachycardia. If the left side is involved, we will see pulmonary edema, hypotension, an S3 heart sound, and again tachycardia. In most cases, if the left side is involved, the right side eventually is going to be involved because we're going to back up. So we back up from the left side through the lung, through the right side and into the peripheral system. However, if we're lacking pulmonary edema and we have peripheral edema, that really points more toward a right-sided type of failure. I mentioned before about the compensatory mechanisms and compensation. What happens with compensation is that whenever there's a decrease in cardiac output, we will have three main systems that are stimulated. The sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin system, and aldosterone. The sympathetic nervous system tells the heart to beat harder and faster. In a situation where we have decreased cardiac output, that would be a good thing. We'd be increasing cardiac output. Remember, one of the components of cardiac output is heart rate. So if we tell the heart to beat faster, that's going to increase cardiac output. So the sympathetic nervous system will increase our blood pressure by increasing cardiac output, and it also causes vasoconstriction, which increases our afterload. So those two components are part of the sympathetic nervous system. The renin-angiotensin system is also kicked in. It causes vasoconstriction and fluid retention. And then aldosterone kicks in, which causes fluid retention and also helps to increase blood pressure. So these compensatory mechanisms are all aimed to try to increase the blood pressure that has dropped as a result of decreased cardiac output. However, in a patient with heart failure, these compensatory mechanisms won't help, and in fact, they make the patient worse. So let's start with the sympathetic nervous system. Telling the heart to beat harder and faster is not going to be effective. If a heart could, it already would beat harder and faster. Secondly, the renin-angiotensin system causes vasoconstriction and fluid retention in a heart that already is not beating well, causing an increase in afterload and an increase in preload is not going to make it more efficient. Lastly, aldosterone causes an increase in fluid retention to increase blood pressure, but again, that's increasing preload in a heart that's already overwhelmed with preload, so it's not going to be helpful. Notice that most of the treatments that we use for heart failure are actually addressing the compensatory mechanisms. Beta blockers block the sympathetic nervous system. 
ACE inhibitors and ARBs block renin-angiotensin, and then aldosterone antagonists such as spirolactone. This is the vicious cycle that we get into with heart failure, where the heart has decreased contractility. And again, in most cases, it's the result of having myocardial ischemia, which causes a decrease in cardiac output, then a decrease in blood pressure, decreased oxygenation to the tissues, which also it leads to decreased oxygenation of the heart, which further decreases contractility. In most cases, when we're faced with this, what we're seeing outwardly is the decrease in blood pressure and the decreased oxygenation to the tissues, where we'll see a decrease in level of consciousness, etc. So we tend to focus on treating those symptoms. Let's give the patient a positive inotrope, right? So we're trying to increase our contractility, bring that blood pressure up, give the patient fluids. All of those things are focused on trying to increase blood pressure. However, as we talked about earlier, those compensatory mechanisms only make the patient worse. Where we should be focusing our efforts on is increasing the oxygenation to the heart first. So think about it like an IV pump. If the pump is beeping and saying low battery, it doesn't help to turn up the rate. First, you have to plug in the pump. Same thing is true here. We need to plug in the pump before we tell it to work harder. So our prompt action for our patient who's having heart failure is to increase the oxygen supply to the heart, decrease the oxygen demand, okay, and some of the things that we can do, well the primary thing that's going to increase demand in our patients is the activities we do with our patient, getting the patient up, turning, positioning, all those kind of things increase oxygen demand. So we want to try to stagger our activities as best we can so that we're not causing an increase in demand that is trying to cause the imbalance here between oxygen supply and demand. Positive inotropes may be helpful, but remember, plug in the pump before we tell it to work harder. So we may have to use some positive inotropes, maybe something like digoxin or maybe something a little bit more uh, IV oriented such as dopamine or dobutamine. We want to block the compensatory mechanisms because again this is what's making the patient worse. So the sympathetic nervous system, again that's our beta blockers, the renin-angiotensin system, that's our ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and then blocking aldosterone with spirolactone. Thanks for joining me here for Nursing Emergencies Cardiac Heart Failure. Let's move on to the next series.